This week in Latitudes, we'll take an awe-inspiring trip to the highlands of Papua New Guinea and visit a genuine custom village. Then take the plunge with some oceanic giants as they come back from an uncertain future. And then we'll close our account in the Pacific paradise of Guam and see the highlights of the nation capital. All this and more in this episode of Latitudes. Australia's most southern state of Tasmania boasts many tourism attractions. The Tiana region itself offers a diverse range of beautiful natural wonders, just a short hour's drive from the capital Hobart. The valley follows the Tiana River, the magnificent clear waters offering some excellent trophy trout fishing. Visitors have been coming to the Tiana region since the 1800s. Tasmania's first official nature reserve was formed around the Russell Falls in 1885. The three-tiered Russell Falls is about a half-hour return walk, taking you through the rainforest along the Russell Falls Creek. Or you may choose to continue on with a picturesque two-hour circuit walk from Russell Falls to Horseshoe Falls. The Pandani Grove 40-minute nature walk in the Lake Dobson Alpine area of Mountain Field takes you through Tasmania's alpine vegetation and pencil pines thousands of years old. At Medina, the Juni Cave Resurgence provides a wonderful peek into the past. Here, the Juni River emerges from the cave after travelling underground through mountains for many kilometres. Further along the Gordon River Road past Medina is the magnificent Styx Valley, which features the tallest hardwood forests on Earth. Some trees are up to 96 metres tall and 6 metres wide at the base. The Styx Valley of the Giants is becoming famous because of the high-profile conservation campaigns being run to protect its ancient forests. On the way into the National Park, there's the opportunity to see a delightful wildlife sanctuary for orphaned and injured animals. A viewing platform allows visitors a view of the Tiana River, which is home to a family of platypus living happily in the natural environment. They're seen regularly as they go about their daily routine. In their spacious habitat, hand-reared Tasmanian devils enjoy the natural features of their environment, with sunning rocks and trees to climb. Ben and Florentine are the resident wombats, both saved from road accidents and now enjoying the security of the sanctuary. Koalas Stan and Susie live in their natural bushland environment and interact playfully with each other in between eating copious amounts of eucalyptus leaves. There's a soft release rehabilitation centre where injured and orphaned animals recover their strength in safety and can come and go as they please. Abundant bird life and the spacious interpretation centre with its animal nursery and interactive displays make something wild well worth a visit. Further along your trip you'll find the Mountfield National Park Centre with its beautiful surroundings and excellent facilities. Electric barbecues by the riverside, sheltered picnic tables, a children's playground. If mountain cabin accommodation appeals, speak to the staff about the rustic government huts nestled in the alpine area of the park. The National Park and Visitor and Interpretation Centre is a comfortable, modern building filled with friendly faces eager to pass on information to help you learn more about the National Park, its walks, animals and plants. The National Park's friendly staff can explain how to get the best value from your park's visit. Both the Tiana and Russell Falls River are home to platypus and at night wildlife abounds. Back at Russell Falls, darkness reveals an excellent display of glowworms. During the summer, park rangers provide a range of free activities including slideshows, children's activities 
even talks by a Tasmanian tiger expert. In the visitor centre you'll find the Waterfalls Cafe, with John and Anne ready to make you welcome, in a natural leafy glade midst towering tall trees. This cafe has an excellent reputation for generous lunches, morning and afternoon teas, served inside in the warm and al fresco in the delightful covered area. Enjoy fresh Tasmanian produce like Atlantic salmon with fine Tasmanian wine for lunch or a delicious Devonshire tea of scones and homemade premium local raspberry jam. For those wanting something lighter, there's a wide range to choose from. Toasted sandwiches, focaccias, and on cold days, a big bowl of hearty soup will hit the spot. The adjoining park shop has been specially stocked with an excellent range of Tasmanian crafts, Australian-made clothing, and carries one of the state's largest ranges of souvenirs. The land of the Giants Caravan Park and campground by the Tyana River has free electric barbecues, powered and unpowered sites, and excellent amenities, hot showers and laundry facilities. This is a unique part of Tasmania's natural heritage and is easily accessible. There are opportunities for longer day walks and overnight bushwalking for those visitors who come suitably prepared. The history, tall trees, scenery, waterfalls, the animals, trout fishing make the Tyana region a unique and diverse area to visit. On our last piece of exploration around the islands of Guam, we'll find that when the night falls in paradise, the entertainment options are wide open. As one of the most progressive of Pacific nations, Guam boasts a huge variety of venues for those of a more civilised inclination. From the prerequisite American fast food giants to the more secluded and romantic restaurants, Guam can fulfil every need you can possibly imagine. The exclusive clubs and black tie affairs held in the capital city reflect the strong American influence while maintaining the strong connection with the island's tradition. There are many five-star luxury hotels with full world-class entertainment and cabaret floor shows. And for the younger at heart, many dance clubs and nightclubs, catering for disco to line dancing. Although the capital city and surrounding areas have enough to keep visitors busy, a trip around the island provides a glimpse into the island's heartland. In nearby Hagatnya, Guam's bustling capital, latte stones attest to the island's long heritage. As early as 500 AD, Chamorros built their homes on these stone pillars. As its name indicates, the Plaza de España dates to the Spanish era. The open parkland was a site of the governor's palace and serves as a reminder of gracious bygone days. History of a more recent era lives in the Wanda Pacific Historical Park. This national park commemorates the bravery and sacrifice of all those who lost their lives here during the final days of World War II. In southern Guam, life goes much as it has in the past. It is believed that Magellan first made contact with the Chamorro people here when he landed in the Umatak in 1521. Built in the early 1800s on the bluff above Umatak Bay, Fort Nuestra Señora de la Soledad served as the vantage point to watch for Spanish galleons, laden with golden spices or English pirates. And nowhere is Spanish influence more evident than sleepy seaside villages like Umatag, Ben Yeso, and Aljahan. Located three miles off Guam's southern tip is tiny Cocos Island, a 100-acre resort surrounded by clear turquoise lagoons. 
Formerly a coconut plantation, the island has emerged as one of Guam's most popular attractions. Regularly scheduled boats transport visitors from Elso to Cocos Islands. Inland Guam offers the serenity of the tropics. Rivers cut through the interior, providing opportunities for kayaking and for walks to hidden waterfalls. Guam's people are committed to preserving this natural heritage of the island and are working hard to ensure the quality of Guam as a destination for international travellers and as a home for themselves and their children, enriched by their past and poised on the brink of a dynamic future. Guam virtually glows with the energy of a world-class destination. The ancient word for Guam is Guam, meaning we have. Come and discover what the nation of Guam has for you. Come and discover Guam. In many remote areas of the Pacific and Indian Oceans, whale sharks have come under increasing environmental pressures. However, in a few places, they are gaining a greater admiration. A remote Philippine town is fighting to protect the world's biggest fish, the Donsol whale shark, and at the same time attract tourists into the area. This positive concept of tourism is helping developing countries to manage their natural resources and promote sustainable livelihoods for the local communities. Known as a butanding by the people in Donsol, this gentle giant of the ocean can grow up to 15 metres long and weigh more than 15 tonnes. The villagers of Ogod in Donsol are placing the finishing touches on a replica whale shark for a festival celebrating the creatures. School children gather excitedly to paint pictures of the whale shark and explain why the marine environment must be protected. The annual festival has been held ever since a swarm of whale sharks were found in the local waters. Here in Donsol, the government is working on ecotourism that aims to promote and manage the interaction between whale sharks and tourists. It's one way to show the long-term commercial and environmental value of the marine species. Promoting tourism in the area is one way out of the current economic hardships and the local tour operators are hoping their efforts will prove that the whale sharks are worth more alive than dead. One such area which has successfully put these concepts into practice is the Exmouth region of Western Australia. Here, successful tourist interactions have been carefully managed for many years. Whale sharks by nature are mainly solitary creatures and despite their impressive appearance, are harmless to humans. Scuba divers and underwater swimmers are able to safely get quite close to their huge bodies. In order to create awareness among the public of the shark's plight, international conservation group WildAid launched a life-size balloon of the endangered whale shark in Singapore and gathered many signatures from the small but adoring crowd. Although the whale sharks are revered in many areas, sharks in general are under threat. One hundred million are slaughtered every year as international demand for shark fins and other shark products skyrockets, driving a massive increase in shark fishing around the world. Shark fins are considered a great delicacy in many Asian countries, particularly Hong Kong, Singapore and Taiwan, where they are served in top-class restaurants as shark fin soup. Slowly though, through many efforts like that of WildAid, 
people are becoming more and more aware of the shark's plight. Hopefully that will contribute to a greater awareness and less consumption for shark products. In recent years though, the whale shark has become the focus of a booming international dive industry. And studies have estimated whale shark tourism generates much more income for countries than the hunting and sale of its meat and fins. Proof is now emerging that whale shark ecotourism could be one of the key factors behind the survival of the species. Meanwhile, back at Ningaloo near Exmouth, the well-managed ecotourism of these outstanding fish awaits anybody with the passion to see them. New Guinea is an island off the remote North Australian coastline and is a former colony of Australia. Today, it is an independent state. Located on the equator and just west of the Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea's weather is mostly hot and humid. It is an extreme and rugged country and its high mountain ranges extend the entire length of the island. Air New Guinea operate a number of aircraft that travellers can use to travel from one area to another. And the locals use the planes for visiting relatives in larger towns. Air travel is really the only way to traverse this country, as there are very few bitumen roads outside the larger cities. And even extended trips with four-wheel vehicles is extremely difficult in this mountainous topography and virtually impossible in the rainy season. Small landing strips are located throughout the country and there are daily services to most. The airline is the only service that is able to maintain a steady and reliable system to transport much needed supplies to these remote areas, such as the Sepik River. Like the mountains, the Sepik River also runs nearly the length of the nation and is one of the world's longest rivers. And this is one of the most exciting regions of this most interesting and unique of countries. This river offers the tourist a real opportunity to visit tribal people who are living life as their ancestors did and have done so for countless generations. The Sepik River is comparable to the Amazon and its people. This is the village called Combat and is nestled in on the banks of the Sepik. This particular village welcomes visitors and even has a guest house of sorts. The river is both a blessing and a curse to the villagers, such as Combat, which is located on its banks. The river has a rise and fall of over 10 metres during the year. Most of the time, the river benefits the villagers by supplying food in a number of forms, which includes fish. However, during the rainy season, the river floods the surrounding areas. So it's impossible for the people to maintain any real crop system, as every year the crops are simply washed away. These young girls are preparing a meal of sago, which is basically mashed bark from the sago palm and is the staple diet throughout the rainy season. The bark is stripped from the tree and crushed to form a paste. The work is manual and mostly the young girls and women prepare the bark for cooking. Once the bark has reached the required paste form, the girls hand it over to the older women for the final stage of cooking and presenting the meal to the entire village. The sago is presented as a cooked meal and is usually served on a palm leaf or in a carved wooden bowl. Meals are an important part of the culture as even the youngest members of the village play some role in either gathering or preparing the meals. When the river is not flooding, other meals such as fish and in this case shrimps can be on the menu. Poultry and other harvested crops are also enjoyed during these times.
Wombat Village has recently begun to produce an income to help it overcome the difficulties of the rainy season. The villagers sell their carvings, which assist them to purchase food and other medical supplies. The carvings are exquisite pieces and can only be produced in relatively small quantities, as each carving is unique. The same traditional methods, which have been handed down over many generations, are used in the creation of the individual pieces. The carvings represent village life and the storyboards are carvings of events that signify important events or aspects of combat village. Some stories on these boards recall events that occurred during the early years of the village's beginning. Another item of interest, which can be quite large, are the shields. These were once used for fighting. The importance of the spirit world to protect the warrior can't be overstated. Therefore, strict rituals and procedures are adhered to in the making of a shield. The shields are also used for burials. And again, the importance in ritual during the making of the shield is a significant component to the process. Visitors to the villages along the Sepik River are welcomed in unusual ways and although this may seem off-putting, many of the villagers are really a very peaceful people. Each welcome has a story behind it, however with over 700 dialects of the prime language, communication is not easy and the meaning of the stories can be hard to determine. It is important to enrol a guide who is fluent in the languages of the areas you wish to visit. The white visitors to their village intrigued these young children. This was the first time this village had seen a white person. These children are also for the first time seeing their own reflection in the form of a camera screen. These are some of the special moments that a visit to the remote regions of Papua New Guinea holds for the traveller who wishes to explore the more remote regions of the world. For more information on artefacts from the Sepik River region, be sure to check the Latitudes website. Join Latitudes again when we next trek the globe and explore fabulous and exciting holiday destinations. For further information regarding any story on this episode, log on to www pbtv.com.au This program is proudly supported by Pata and Always Dive Australia.